I think we can uh, we can get started. Yeah, hello folks. Uh, my name is Neil Gompa. I was here on the stage just a little bit ago, but I have a new companion this time. David Duncan, come on, introduce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm David Duncan. I'm a, a well, in the Fedora team, I work on the cloud uh, edition and um, I've spent a lot of time um, working on that in my professional life. I'm a partner solutions architect and I work on cloud um, cloud images and cloud solutions for Amazon. Yeah, and I actually also wind up occasionally working with him professionally too because uh, I work at Red Hat as a um, senior black belt on managed OpenShift solutions and that means that I get to interact with him when working on Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS. So, or Rosa as everyone loves to call it. Um, so we're here kind of to talk about, you know, you know, with you, all of you, this is a participatory panel thing about, you know, cloud images and getting, you know, people to be able to make their own, what kind of process type stuff and, you know, what we hope to achieve and what you would like to see from Fedora Cloud to help make your lives better running Fedora in the cloud. I think, I think one of the things, too, that we're, we're curious about is um, where in your, you know, where in your workflow might you have, a, you know, a good uh, space for something like a bespoke image? Um, we spend a lot of time looking at what we can do to create images that are small, minimalized, and, um, and provide sort of a generic base, but uh, that's not quite, I mean, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, when it comes to, um, comes, comes to how the cloud, um, cloud experience works. You know, you, you want to be able to generate manifests and create um, application space that is uh, specific to your workloads. I mean, there are many things that we, we, um, we do in our daily experience that, um, that we don't want to do twice effectively. And so just to give you a great example, the, uh, the core OS images that are created for building out the, um, the OpenShift services uh, for all of the public cloud providers um, is, uh, is in fact not just CoreOS. It is CoreOS and a series of tools and technologies that are necessary for deployment um, so that we can get that, you know, get that um, uh, deployment model down uh, or, or decrease the amount of time uh, to, uh, to, ready, to, to a ready state. Right, and you know, it, you know, like with the things like Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, or if you're running, you know, maybe as we were talking about yesterday in our talk about Fedora Cloud KDE, right? Like these are scaffolds of workloads that we build to provide something useful and differentiated on uh, on the cloud that that you will be enriched with, and we want to know, like, we, what we want to do is. You know, we want to help you be successful in the cloud doing these kinds of things and doing cool stuff with it. And we want to know what you guys are doing in the cloud with this stuff to help us, or, to help them. Yeah, just, just as important is, is what documentation do you think is, is significant to, to make the next generation of your, of your uh, experience with the cloud edition better, right? It doesn't have to, obviously it doesn't have to run on a public cloud or it doesn't have to run on some managed cloud. It can run on your desktop and, and uh, we expect that experience to be just as important, just as, uh, just as critical um, for, for others. And with some of the things that you can do now with cloud init and in uh, vert install and. Yeah, and, there's a lot of ways yeah. to like, there, uh, like there, are some of the things you may not be aware that the the cloud working Fedora cloud working group actually maintains is, you know, the vagrant images are ours, right? Like we we take we take care of the vagrant work stuff. Um, I think we recently started doing what cubevert images or something like that, yes. and um, we're also doing things around. Uh, uh, adding it to additional cloud providers. We just added Azure recently, and 
Um, we're looking at Oracle Cloud and a couple of other providers just to kind of round out the table of things. And we've always had the network of, you know, the common VPSs like your Linodes and DigitalOceans and, and things like that that we've also been having our offering on for many years. So anyone got something that you want to? Yeah. Looks like that guy. Hey, how are you doing? Um, my name is Brian and I work quite a bit with uh, Upstream Qvert. So I actually came here today to ask you about if the Cloud SIG would have an interest in uh, publishing images for Qvert VMs, basically. Because yeah, yeah I think we have the definitions for making them, but we don't know where to put them. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think at the moment we're building our own kind of container disk images, which are basically just kind of wrapping, we say Fedora Cloud, uh, CentOS Cloud, images. Um, mm -hmm. So they rely on CloudNet and then we store them in Quay as container images. Sure. sure. Um, so yeah, it's great to hear that you're interested in, in actually developing some of these images because that's fantastic. Like our goal here is to provide all uh, uh, the deliverables that are needed for people to have an end-to-end -end positive experience using Fedora technologies in in the cloud development and production process. So whether that's on your computer or actually in your infrastructure or somewhere in between, like we want to, we want to make that experience good and uh, help, help you succeed in that front. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that made us excited to talk about this today was that we wanted to talk about what tools are available, right? And so uh, a couple of the things that are available right now is is uh, is just being able to create the build definitions inside of Koji and then build those in Koji. And we were worried that you know there are a lot of people who don't know, or in our community, right, who don't know that they in fact have that op that uh, that um, ability ability. Yeah, just t today, right, to to generate those images in a way that is consistent with their expectations. I know Adam knows about it because because uh, he does it. Yeah. <laughs> A lot. Well, we appreciate you, Adam. <laughs> yeah. And um, well, and but he was also very vocal about learning and uh, you know learning how to do it. And and uh, uh, there's there's probably if you were to if you were to just wander back in in the uh, infra lists, you'd probably find some great uh, great conversation around around that, that process yeah. from him. But we want. You know, we wanted to make sure that the, everyone knows that these the tools are there. The um, there are some other you know there are tools for uploading to uh, cloud providers and and whatnot that are there. And we while we don't expect that we'll be doing that for everyone um, individually, we expect that you know if there's an image that we need to have in a place that makes it available for specific cloud providers, that that's something that we would manage and maintain for you. And then. The you know obviously OS build is out there to help you do that in your own independent uh, like in your own individual accounts or whatnot. Yeah. So if you're using um, uh, Image Builder, Composer, whatever uh, for, you know, it's gone by a bunch of different names. All uh, all the things uh, that OS build do, uh, is the back end of, right? You have some way of producing these things in your own environment. We also, uh, I mean, the the tools that we're using in Fedora Cloud Day. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a transition, moving away from some of our legacy tools that are kind of specific, that can only kind of run effectively in Fedora infrastructure, to stuff that people can run anywhere. So whether it's OS build or um, in some images we'll be look, we're looking at using Kiwi for. And the idea is that we want to move to a model where everything that we're making is something you can make too, because like we know that as much as we want to serve and offer all these wide variety of things. The key power of the cloud is being able to build for yourself, tailoring it to your experience. And we want to make that a core tenant of what we are doing. We want everything that we're making to be something you can take and make your own. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of times where we get feedback from the cloud providers about you know, security or uh, like some, some sort of uh, vulnerability that they don't want to see in the machine image you know, it, as such. <sighs> they want to see it. They want to see a new image d deployed, and then that Im you know that uh, that image has uh, the governance around that is really is really complicated because we we really want to just 
put out one image and then put out an update, uh, uh, you know, associated with it. Um, but their process doesn't uh, fit that. Uh, you know, fast forward to the customer experience, right? Uh, then you start, they start to have a deeper impact on their own customers. Their own customers think that, oh, okay, well now we know that our process is to update our machine images and then, and then, uh, or, or, or just images, depending on who it is. And then, and then uh, uh, the updates themselves are there for us to be able to make something that is more uh, consistent, but then to make it like, you know, once, once every two weeks or so, you know. Um, so we know that the people who are, people who are working on uh, cloud solutions are also being, you know, have a, a, a high amount of pressure to uh, I issue new images instead of just creating a patch management uh, model for, for the instances that they create from those, right? Yeah, because if you're in the more ephemeral world and you have the ability to subscribe to a feed to get the latest image every time you, you provision, then you probably want to take advantage of that. But on the flip side, if you're one that's starting from this and you have a, a machine environment that's sticking around for some time and you're going to keep it and life cycle it, then you, you would favor, you know, being able to do patch management and things like that. So being able to handle both types of workflows is something that we, we try very hard to also do. But, yeah. and that kind of comes back to, you know, we, we're trying to make our tools easier and simpler and more flexible to be able to handle these divergent use models yeah. because they're, they're both valid. And we want to make sure that people are happy using these things in the cloud, locally, wherever. Yeah, the Kiwi decision was one that, that came about because we were looking at how to create um, uh, composable image um, definitions, and it was just a fantastic way to do it. And we could create any, basically any kind of image we wanted from the WSL all the way out. Um, and um, so we're, we were, um, we've been pushing in that direction. On the other hand, um, you know, the uploads and configuration and like post, post config, we started off trying to determine how we could build our own tools, but then it looked like Ansible actually does most of what we needed to do. So, um, so we turned our, we turned the, the cloud team has kind of turned towards uh, maintaining those, um, the software development kits in, you know, in Fedora so that we can have full support for the, um, for the, uh, uh, the Ansible collections that support them. And ideally, like, these are things people can take and use in their own environments. One of the, you know, I spent eight years as a DevOps and uh, doing DevOps type stuff. And, you know, one of the things that made my job challenging was that I saw all these interesting things and ways that people were doing stuff. And things that I could have loved to use in my own environment but they didn't make it accessible or, or available for me to be able to easily take it, adapt it, and extend it for my own use cases. Well, it's still not easy to, to like integrate with the infrastructure. Yeah, um, I know, but I'm, I'm Ansible, speaking aspirationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. aspirationally. Yeah. So good. like, this is something that we, like David and I have been like working really hard on trying to like make that a, 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 guiding, uh, a guiding point for us when we're, when we're making our new decisions about how things are supposed to work and what we're producing, but it also allows us to put limits on what we are going to do. And for example, we're probably not going to make a cloud variant of literally everything that, that exists in Fedora. There, well, we don't need to. That's, yeah. But we want to. But we definitely do want to make a you know cloud variants that are that are going to do things that we think are are. Um, going to segue into more of a Fedora experience. So there are lots of people who come to, so one of the things that I talked about yesterday actually in the cloud, cloud discussion was, was, the, um, was how we looked at the, like Cloud9, right? Cloud9 in, inside of Amazon doesn't have a Fedora-based image, but it could. And yeah. so, you know, it's, uh, for us, that's, uh, that's something that we want, we, we are looking at how we can produce. Um, it's, I mean, obvious back, obviously backlogged on, on uh, other things like getting rid of Python 2.7. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, 
but we're you know it's it's a um, the you know our our goal is to see how those things can fit into the process that you know processes that um, that users are already dealing with and say hey I you know I I can use Fedora as a as a foundation for this instead of just using um, you know some other distribution yeah and like uh, it kind of riffing off of that a lot of this was well you know sysadmins that are like in an emergency scenario they're away from their main computer station you know being able to spin up like say a cloud KD desktop that's got like you know their OpenShift and Rosa command line utilities their cube definitions their access to their their version control <laughs> systems all that push button provision so that they can do emergency work um, in the environment that they can actually be comfortable with I mean, God, I don't know if any of you have been a sysadmin in the mobile phone on-demand era like, like I've been, and, but that sucks. Typing into a terminal and having to like do things from, your, from, a, from a crappy phone console that's in, in Android or iOS compared to like being able to access like a remote desktop from a web browser is, uh, yeah, I would take the remote desktop in a web browser because then I'd have access to all the tools that I actually need to, to function. And, and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we're looking at to like enable cloud experiences, but also we want to have a framework where like, let's say for example, um, uh, you know, the Python classroom, the Python SIG who maintains the Python classroom um, uh, lab for Fedora wants to also have a cloud variant. They are perfectly capable of reusing our framework to be able to provide that on their own as part of their lab. We don't have to do it for them. No. We would give them the tools and the capability to just do it and make it part of their own deliverables. We want to be able to provide that kind of flexibility to people in the same way is, so that they can actually have their own tools for success. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, we think other, all, a lot of other groups are feeling that they, they see that segue and we want to help them. You're not in the, you're not. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we want to, we want to hear you know, we want, we, we think that there are other members of other teams that are looking at things that they want to be able to stand up quickly, they want to verify, you know, they may be working on Winbind or they may be working on, on uh, you know, Keycloak. Um, but there, but there's, uh, there's a lot of things out there that you want to just be able to, to bring up, look at, and uh, and drop and and uh, that process of building those machine images and making sure that you have the updates and that you have sort of a you know a basically a step you know kind of a step function style approach to ensuring that you have what you need. Um, we want to help make that make that a reality for lots lots of other groups. Maybe you want to work on open QA on an, on a virtual machine, right? <laughs> Perhaps you want to be able to make your own just environment to do all this stuff just with pushing a button in the cloud. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, just keep it. <laughs> Sorry. So, so you mentioned uh, that members can build their own images. Is there a good starting point for that? Is there a Cloud Sig Docs page, or is there a good starting point for that? I don't think we're quite there yet. We're trying to. The, the, I mean, that's what we're doing. That's part of our goals with the rework of our yeah. I, of our fact, image build stuff. In fact, that was a little bit of what I was hoping to to get us a, a springboard for today is to see where where the interest is and how how we want to um, how we want to frame frame that documentation. Yeah, it's so like part of the reason we did the Cloud KD talk yesterday and why we're doing this panel today is we wanted to have some interest and, and learn from y'all, like what kind of stuff would you be, that you would find compelling and interesting to do with Fedora Cloud stuff. And yeah. because we, we have some ideas of what we want to do and I, and I think we're on a good path, but we also want to hear from y'all to see like what are you interested in, yeah. what are you looking for, what kind of questions do you have about like doing stuff in with Fedora in the cloud and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll be honest. The, the Kubevert thing is super exciting to me because um, you know there's there's two aspects of that. One, so one, just generally, Kubevert you know is a is a great way to to, to create a a great moder modernization strategy. And two, um, it segues into some of the work around 
um, lightweight virtual machine environments that uh, we have not gotten an opportunity to work on just yet, but you know, porting to Firecracker and things like that is a big deal. Also, congratulations CubeVert for reaching 1.0. You finally got, you finally did it. Yeah, we finally got there, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you also mentioned Rosa on the side. I was just wondering, is, is container native virtualization included in Rosa? In the, in the um, I don't think so. We, uh, can we, I don't, yeah, I don't think it so, is a thing. Uh, yeah, we, so there's it's, a couple. It's, it's, yeah. a him, it's a him question for whether we'll ever do it though. Uh, so, so whether or not it'll be supported, that's a, that's kind of a question. That's yeah. questionable, but then, but like there are flags in the metal instances where we're still working on the metal support. Yeah, like most of the reason why we can't do it is because the instance types we support literally don't let us. Um, and also it just, to some level, it feels weird, right? I mean, I, I think there are reasons where I think it would make sense, but like you could also just EC2 and, and so like, but I also can get the idea of like you want to have the abstraction and the, sim the same API everywhere to be able to do all the things. Well, but you want to do your testing and get yeah. net, nested vert. And then there's that. And I mean like part of the, so this is going to step back into peeling back a little curtains about Fedora Cloud stuff. Part of the issue that makes Fedora Cloud images currently today so kind of painful is because the tools currently require us to boot up into a virtual machine to produce the cloud images, which, and the cloud and the virtual machine boot up process is kind of special. Uh, and that makes it difficult for people to be able to replicate our processes on their own. And I want to move away from processes that are so complicated that like someone who's like just getting started fresh into this stuff and is excited doesn't get so discouraged that they want to flame right out of the whole thing. I mean, you can, you know, you can flatten a kickstart now and just figure out what's, what's in the, you know, what's in the process, but that's like, that's just one way to make a virtual machine. I mean, you could literally make it in the same way that you make an open VZ, you know, or made an, made an open VZ image. I you hope know. you're not making open VZ yeah. containers today. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the same way that you know we did a gazillion years ago, and that's that's not uh, that's not unusual. Um, I know the Amazon Linux team when they when they build an when they build an image, it's basically just you know it's a tar file, right? I mean, when it, when when you're finished, um, and I don't think that. You know, I, you know this is this is also one of those places where there's more than one way to skin skin you know skin this cat, and and I think that that's that's a uh, an important part of the um, of what I think is interesting for us is that we don't necessarily have to do this in a way that is consistent with the expectations of the the one tool. You know, if we decide or determine that there's something that we want to do here that's different, we can we can. Um, we can be versatile and as I'll, long as it's maintainable because yeah. what we don't want to wind up is in a situation where we have a litany of things where we don't actually know how we can keep them going oh well, agreed yeah. but you know if we're helping somebody sure work on their process I don't want I don't want it to be constrained to like oh well they're using Kiwi so no 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 <laughs> not yeah that's not that's not what I mean right like I if, if a tool is is kind of central to building the thing that they that they want or need, and we need to, and as long as it's straightforward enough to integrate and and and, and support, I don't yeah. have a problem with it. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of different directions you can go with how you make your you know how you create your pro or how your process, uh, whether or not that process is consistent with the one that we have. And I think I don't think that that's that should be something that would concern, you know, concern you. The most, I mean, to me, the most helpful thing is knowing that you can pull this, you can you can pull together this configuration, you can push that into the util the tools that we have already in place. You can get um, your build alerts in the same way that you would get them with any other Fedora project, um, and uh, you know you can throw you can throw them over to Adam for testing. <laughs> or Adam might just do it anyway and then tell you he did it. That's right. Any other questions? Any other 
Comments? Comments, yeah. There we go. This is more looking farther into the future, but one of the things that I'd like to do eventually is more or working with like GPU instances in Fedora. Mm -hmm. um, and that's predicated on getting all of the stuff packaged in Fedora so that it works. Yep. Um, uh, but is that something, you know, reason assuming we can get everything to work, is that something you think would be reasonable? Yes, actually. So like um, we briefly d mentioned this yesterday during our Cloud KDE talk, like GPU accelerated instances and being able to support them properly in Fedora Cloud is absolutely on our roadmap of requirements. Most, most, of, the, most of the public cloud providers also have the ability to distribute the NVIDIA controller drivers, so we can we can we can cheat piggyback mm -hmm. off of that. Yeah, I guess the 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 I don't know, one of the problems I'm seeing is where, where we're starting is with AMD, not with uh, NVIDIA. That's fine and too. I know of better. one cloud provider who has one instance that has an AMD GPU in it, and hey, it's that's better than not zero. current. It's a but couple it's of generations old. It's better than nothing, but yeah. Um, like I was just saying, I mean, just the, all the cloud providers do have NVIDIA. There's Amazon has one instance that has an AMD GPU in it, and I have not been able to find a single other cloud provider that has an AMD well, GPU. Well, then props to AWS for having AMD Radeon GPUs. It's pretty good. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, get, newer ones would be awesome. New, yeah, more new ones would be Because it's awesome. not technically supported by ROCKM. Uh, uh, there's questions. I mean, it's not on AMD's official list. Well, uh, uh, whether it works or not is a different question. It's yeah. just it's not on their current official. These are the GPUs we support, and then the one that's in AWS is different. Well, I suspect you know I'm not going to speak for David, but I, at least from the Fedora Cloud perspective, I think if we start having those toolkits in place and being able to have instances, uh, have images and in, with that stuff preloaded, that they that instances when they're provisioned on those instances, that they can just take advantage of them. I think they're going to see a different dynamic start building up for it. But, you know, yeah, what do you we, want to talk about from the Amazon side? Well, yeah, I mean, so from, from the Amazon side, we, we have our own uh, crafted drivers for, for those. So <coughs> excuse me. The, the way that works for, um, from the Amazon perspective is the drivers are produced by AMD for, for the AWS environment, and then they're maintained in an S3 location for for the, for um, for the instances, but they're available and they're easy for us to distribute. And there is a rail workstation uh, that's that was created for specifically that reason um, okay. to in, to have the uh, to have two things that incorporated into the instance. One was the GPU drivers um, for the G, for uh, for both. Um, standard GPU workloads and general purpose GPU workloads. And then to have on top of that the, the um, nice DCV um, VDI solution in, in place so the server's already there, you just connect to it with a client and then it's basically like running, running it uh, where you are. And the reason we wanted to do the KDE um, workstation is because we don't have an upstream kind of, of uh, experience for people to have, have that same uh, you know, to iterate on for this for some of the same reasons. So uh, we're really super interested in making sure that you know customers have or users have that available to them um, because the user um, the user experience around machine learning on Fedora is a story that we very much need to tell. <laughs> yeah, I no, I did a t I, that was part of one of my talks yesterday was. Yeah, what it is and hopefully how we're going to fix it. I am, for, from my perspective, I am super excited about seeing um, the ability to use GPU compute in, in Fedora out, out of the gate. I'm seeing the Rockham stack get integrated in and being able to start doing that kind of thing. Uh, I hope that it, what it will do is encourage more um, GPU compute workloads, whether it's AIML or something else. I mean, render farms are another example of GPU compute workloads uh, that will use AMD GPUs with open drivers and an open software stack that, you know, everyone gets to exercise the flexibility and freedom that they need to be able to do what they want and not what somebody else prescribes of them. Well, and, and just like you're doing, you know, our, our goal is to build this narrative so that people don't forget or don't think that 
just because there is another narrative, right, that this one is, is absent. We want to make sure that this one is, is very clear and in, you know, in their, um, within, you know, within their space. So for me, you know, the machine learning, I mean, if, if you'll let me soapbox for just a minute. Like, Go for it. <laughs> the machine learning conversation is one that I think is really hard because um, first off, you know, most of the applications that make this space um, or work in this space are impossible to package, right? I mean, we've, ha we've had that conversation to, uh, several times. And then uh, the way that others have approached this um, has been to take all of that stuff that they can't really figure out how to package, throw it into slash opt, create an image, and then just, just make that available. And that's... How kind of you. It's a scary, you know, to me that's not, it's not a helpful model, right? Like there's no way to do updates, there's no, there's a consistency there uh, that maybe I, I, I might like as a, um, as a scientist, but the, but the real, but this goes back to our, like, the whole idea of developing images for yourself. We want to have those images in, you know, like, in my project, in my account, right? I want to have those those um, uh, those images, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I I want to find them out there in the world, you know, in in an incredibly vulnerable state for you know for super long, or I want to you know I want to find out that they are they disappear at some you know amazingly fast rate uh, that makes it impossible for me to have a steady workflow. So I mean I I would love for us to 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 um, to try and figure out how we can do that, you know, uh, Akash Deep and his work on on the neuro uh, neuro fedora, I have thought was a great um, a great entryway into this space, um, and but it's but it's not, you know, I mean, Open Data Hub right was uh, was a really important part of that process uh, around the OpenShift experience, and uh, I'm, and you know we we have. I mean, I, I have built out machine sets, you know, that were that were um, GPU enabled for um, for doing machine learning workloads in 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 the OpenShift space. But um, really, a lot of that work can be done on a single machine in a very you know in a sort of a limited space. And so you can bring up one one instance, create you know do whatever it is that you're doing against what whatever data lake it is that you're accessing, and then turn that off. And helping people to understand how to do that means giving them the tools that they need to do the work. Just, I want to follow quickly on something that you had said a while back um, to make sure I understood. So it is, is, it is not a requirement for, for Amazon to have the driver supplied by AMD. It's just something that was enabled. So if we had something in Fedora that was completely upstream and didn't have AMD's bi uh, binaries, um, that is an option for yeah. That's okay. totally an option. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. Yeah, you can use the open the open driver stack in there if it's preloaded. Amazon just happens to have a bundle that you can just source in and install if you don't have anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah without but, getting without getting into trouble. No, that's an important part. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Then I'll just ask. I'll ask Isaac's question. No, we don't have the Risk Five images just yet. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, I half expected someone was going to ask it. Like, and I was so prepared. He's leading the witness here, so I'm going. To, I, I will. I'm going to ask two questions. You just asked one of the questions, but the real question is, when will Amazon? support risk 5 in their cloud public cloud I'll, I'll defer to people who are you know more more capable of answering that question because <laughs> that's the chicken and egg so when amazon declare that they're going to do that then we can say okay so when are we going to have fedora um, images to sit on the risk 5 boxes i mean why would we have to wait for amazon to that because we fedora cloud does way more than that so Fedora Cloud is also, you know, we can, you can run these images on personal hypervisors. You just boot them up with Vert install and pass in the cloud, the cloud and user data. Or you use, um, you know, you, you're using Cockpit, 
like in there and then that actually will boot Fedora Cloud Images as, as VMs or you run an OpenStack on RISC-V or you're running uh, KubeVirt. Like there's lots of different ways that this could happen and that's part the, of the Fedora Cloud thing. Th there is, but he's Mr. Amazon, you're Mr. Fedora, right? So, so uh, I, that was a blunt question for Amazon and from a Fedora perspective, then you still have the hardware enablement conundrum, right? Yeah, well. So you, 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 yes, we can do all the things you said, but we have to have the hardware enabled to begin with. It's customer driven. <laughs> and yeah. uh, for us, it's uh, somebody's <laughs> got to give us the stuff to be able to start doing it. Because well, we're, go we're going to help triangulate the giving of the stuff to help you do it. And uh, we're also going to uh, politely encourage all the cloud vendors, not just Amazon, to uh, support. I mean, you can, it's on public record, Alibaba actually have a T-head where they're developing RISC-V servers already and, and their hook, line, and sync uh, bought into this equation. I would love to see Amazon do the same. I have nothing to say to that. I mean, you can't, you can't r rule it out, but you can say the roadmap is definitely driven by, based on what we're, what we're being asked to do. And all I'll say is that Risk Five is an interesting architecture, and I hope that it spring up goes uh, th that the machines bring up go better than previous machine bring ups have. Probably a small question, but do customers not want Risk Five on Amazon? I, I mean, you're asking the wrong guy, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's you know there's some other people who are more deeply aligned with the. You know, Peter DeSantis would be the one to answer to ask that question, not not David Duncan. <laughs> and uh, if we're speaking of people in the third person, Neil Gompa is just like, well, I I would like to have uh, as many architectures supported in Fedora and and offered in platforms and be usable in all the different ways. Um, but I suspect, uh, but I suspect that really it's just most people don't know that they exist, right? Like. You don't ask for something you don't know exists. And, and once you know it exists and you find a reason to want it, then things, the dynamics start changing. And that's true even in like the Fedora open source case, like we started having this interest and development into all these, you know, these architectures because people come in and they're like, we really want this and they start talking about it and other people get excited about it. It's that flywheel of, of, of success. So I, I'd just like to add to that that, uh, yeah, it's a bit premature and early yet for enterprise servers that are risk-based, uh, but they are coming. And if anyone's familiar with the, the guru or the demigod or from Mount Olympus called David Patterson, uh, David Patterson maintains that RISC-V is actually going to supplant all uh, CPU architectures over the next 10 years. And uh, he's, a, you know, he's a former... Uh, x86 guru, etc., and he's ridden the wave at arm, and uh, RISC-V is something that's, it just gives so much choice, flexibility to the HPs of the world, the startup chip vendors of the world, customers, countries like India, China, etc., that uh, it's a, an inevitable equation, but we're not quite there yet. So at some point, yes, um, the Goldman Sachs and the Bloombergs are going to start consuming this and Amazon gonna, is going to spring a surprise on us and uh, hopefully we'll have all done the groundwork to, to enable all the hardware underneath and then we can be off to the races. I mean... Uh, That's my, very lofty. My comment on that is that I remember when James Hamilton said uh, that he thought that ARM was the, was the future. And then it was like three years before, yeah, yeah, but, but three, you know, three years for him to make it make it work. And it was, it was very interesting to see from the, you know, from the perspective of um, of a um, an engineer, uh, because the questions, the question, you know, the questions that. Uh, that happened as a result of, of of that were like more economic than they were than they were uh, anything else. So it's a, it's very interesting. And then and then of course like a series of really amazing engineers started to solve really big problems really fast. And um, 
uh, you know, it's just like that, seeing that the way that hardware can evolve in such a very short amount of time always makes me, you know, it always surprises me and, and that, uh, and, um, uh, I feel, you know, fortunate to have worked with a lot of these people. I will kind of add to this a little bit. Um, you know, your, your comment about how it'll be everywhere and surpass all the other architectures and whatever, um, the... The concern I have right now is that when you look at how RISC-V is evolving and how development is going and manufacturer interest is growing and how CPUs and all this other stuff, I find some degree of credibility that there will be more chips RISC-V than anything else by the end of the decade. I don't know if I could put a pin and say that it means that RISC-V will be the dominant um, computing architecture okay. because of this before, the, other, the fra before. fragmentation between the risk five variants and instruction sets and stuff we don't know how that's going to settle out yet because it's still changing before, even to this day but before we get on to the on to that question let me just say that one of my favorite places to watch what's going on that's going to be relevant to the way that cloud images are being built is uh, the work that's being done in the vert team that Karen runs and <laughs> and uh, and uh, a lot of the things that start start to come back to uh, like what's what's being um, added to the QEMU KVM uh, code code bases makes a huge difference in terms of like what we can support. So yeah. I mean, I would like my my uh, my my goal would be to make sure you know to ensure that that KVM QEMU. Um, uh, Support. Support is, is there, and it's there in a way that we can, we can all take advantage of. And importantly, you know, as I was saying with the fragmentation of the instruction sets, whatever gets implemented in Quemu and that the distributions and all of us rely on, the hardware vendors have to do. It can't really be the other way around. If, if the hardware vendors start stratifying the, 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 because the, risk five um, ties ABI to instruction combinations. So if your instruction combination isn't correct, you cannot run the application. And so we can't have a situation where something calls itself 64-bit RISC-V and you can't run it because you don't know. Like when it tries to come up, it's like, oh, all the instructions are missing, so we can't run. Like there has to be a guaranteed baseline that everybody's going to support for that. And like even today now with Fedora RISC-V being bootstrapped, there are two other separate efforts going on right now that are doing the same bootstrap for different instruction combinations. And that's the part that scares me. Because if we wind up being in a situation where we have to deal with the different instruction subsets that are not compatible, risk is going to fail. Because well, people can't figure out how to work with it. I, I so. want to make sure that we all know we're on a tangent. Yes, I'm we, aware. We, we are. We definitely have rat holes. But let me go back and say the tenure comment was a Patterson quote. Yeah. So put that in context. Yeah. And also that, um, you know, new architectures require a lot of work under the hood from all the distro vendors, upstream yep. uh, kernel enablement. And that in itself is what actually causes a standardization yeah. and helps prevent some of the potential fragmentation. Sure. So that's the beauty of open source. Um, when you're working things and, and it's open hardware definition, uh, and because it's in the open, that means that the definitions will evolve with a little bit of common sense from the community sprinkled all over it. So I, I'm not really too afraid of uh, it going off on potentially on 50 different tangents, which it could. It could for all the edge devices, but RHEL is never going to run on those devices. Sure. So it, and, and Amazon's never going to have to worry about supporting them. So for the enterprise server side of the equation, uh, I feel really competent, uh, confident that um, things will consolidate and come into focus because of the community effort. I mean, it's everyone here and everyone beyond here that helps uh, create RISC-V and helps create Linux. Okay. And, and, and that's the beauty of open source. So to tie it back to Fedora Cloud as we're talking about for this, to bring this tangent back to the nose, I don't care just about the enterprise servers or in just the cloud, but I have to care about, I care about the whole cloud experience down to the person's computer. And so 
it, you know, whether it's Risk Five or whether it's ARM or whether it's you know running a desktop or if it's doing Kubernetes or whatever. Or S390. Or S. Mainframes are special. I'm gonna. That one's getting put aside. Um, but like when you when we're talking about a Fedora cloud experience for that, I don't talk about just Amazon. I talk about just. I also talk about like the desktop that someone's working on to develop the cloud workload. And I talk about the, the, the experience of going between the two and, I, and all of those other things. So there has to be a, an underlying level of consistency at all those levels. You can't have an experience that only works in the server side. It has to work locally too. And that's the piece that, um, you know, with ARM, it took a really, really, really long time. It took twice as long as it did to get the server parts. The server parts were easy. Getting everything else was harder. And, and I am very happy and willing and optimistic about supporting RISC-V for Fedora Cloud. But we have to have all those pieces in place to make yeah. it work. And again, it'll be because we have all those component parts in the KVM QuinU uh, code base, and we'll be looking for that. That's what we work on. And, and, uh, um, and that, means, you know, that means dealing with a lot of special problems like, um, like, you know, how do you get, I mean, on, on cloud instances, one of the things that we worry about is like, how do you get a dump, right? I mean, how do you get a, you get a memory dump? You, what happens to the program crashes? Yeah, where do you, where do you get your, um, yeah, where do you get your debug? Those are- And that's actually are, a surprisingly yeah. difficult problem. It is. But, um, but we wanna be there to help you and anyone uh, who wants to, um, you know, to build specific, specifically cloud images um, or cloud-like images, the, the opportunity to, um, to have our help and to be a part of, the, part of our, you know, part of our experience and part of our, um, uh, really, part of our team. Mm -hmm. We're open. Come join us if you're interested in this stuff. Actually, we need you to come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I think we can call it. Yeah, I, I guess so. Thanks for being here. <laughs>